Hey everyone, this is Lawrence Watkins with the Black Financial Channel and welcome to the Financial June Team 5. These are my five most interesting articles as it relates to Black wealth, finance, and business for today, October 5th, 2020. Let's go ahead and get started. So many of you all probably saw me a few minutes ago actually doing this with no sound like an idiot. Uh, <laughs> so this time, I'm pretty sure that the sound is coming, coming through loud and clear. Uh, so I apologize for the people who are watching me uh, before uh, trying to give this presentation with uh, no sound. So let's go, ahead, let's go ahead and get started today. Uh, the first article comes from Black Enterprise, and it talks about uh, how legendary businessman Reginald Lewis continues to influence generations of Black entrepreneurs. Um, and it talks about his book, of course, uh, uh, Why Should White Guys Have All the Fun? And Reginald Lewis is the first uh, black man or one of the first actually investors period uh, with the TLC group. Uh, and he did a private equity deal back in the eighties with Beatrice Foods uh, that was uh, for $985 million. Um, and he wrote a book about that in his life and uh, other subjects as well uh, called, you know, why should white guys have all the fun? Uh, but this article really goes into detail um, in regards to his uh, career and talks about how this actually is the 25th anniversary of the book coming out and the release in uh, Audible um, of uh, the book and it's narrated by a man that, by the name of J.D. Jackson. Uh, so yeah, please check that out. Also, while you're there, go ahead and pick up uh, Malcolm X's uh, autobiography of Malcolm X. Um, and that's actually narrated by uh, Lawrence Fishburne and that came out earlier this month as well. But uh, Watch the White Guys Have, Have All the Fun is a book that really uh, motivated and inspired a generation. Um, and I think this book is significant because it comes from a man who actually didn't make his money in sports or entertainment. He made his money via Wall Street, um, which, of course, is, is still you know, exclusive, but it's not where most of the Black wealth is actually currently concentrated, which is actually in sports and entertainment. But check out the article. Check out the book on Audible. Um, it, it was just released earlier this month, and I think that you're going to get an inspiring read out of uh, Reginald Lewis's story. Unfortunately, uh, the brother died back, I believe, like in 1993, uh, so you know, quite a while ago, or maybe it was later than. I can't remember exactly what year he actually, he actually or before his death in 1993. There we go. Uh, but um, he's definitely a legend you know, on the pantheon of uh, Black-owned uh, or Black business owners and Black entrepreneurs. The next article comes from Vox, that's Vox Media, and it talks about the Paycheck Protection Program and how it failed many Black-owned businesses. Um, it built on equities that already existed in banking. So uh, it, the story starts with uh, following the CEO of Detroit Made, which is a uh, made you know, service company um, in uh, Detroit. And uh, she talked about, you know, of course, COVID slowing their growth and slowing the amount of work that was coming to them through their business and them transitioning from working in mainly residential areas to trying to pivot to corporate, uh, corporate uh, types of businesses as well. Uh, she states, businesses like mine, we had uh, severe loss in staff and we weren't sure if we were going to be able to make it through uh, May. Uh, but she applied to the PPP program through PayPal, but was actually denied from uh, getting the Paycheck Protection uh, Program loan, which of course was part of the CARES Act to help alleviate the pains that small businesses were facing uh, because of a lack of business in COVID. She has a quote in here that says, uh, they said we didn't meet the criteria and they didn't specify uh, why that actually was. Um, PayPal was responsive, even though the process itself was very cumbersome. Uh, she stated, when I got the results back, I was like, I wonder if I just didn't do it right, especially because there wasn't a specific reason in regards to why she was denied the loan. Uh, later in the article, it talks about some of the disparities as it relates to PPP and also the EDO loan, so the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, so the EIDL. Uh, it states that um, a poll stated 23% uh, of Black business owners who did not receive the PPP um, or EDO uh, and that was compared to 9% of white-owned businesses, 30% of Latino-owned businesses, and 9% of Asian-American-owned um, businesses as well. And the article goes on to state uh, that these gaps were driven by a couple of factors, including 
systemic inequities in banking, a chaotic application process that overwhelmed many small businesses, and restrictive terms on the loans that put off some business owners from pursuing them at all. Uh, so this is just an interesting article that talks about you know, systemic racism and barriers that Black-owned businesses actually face uh, when getting things like loans and um, you know, other types of um, tools that are out here to actually help small businesses. The third article today comes from Bloomberg and it talks about uh, the 15% pledge is a mixed blessing for Black beauty brands. Um, so it talks about uh, many uh, retail businesses and especially in the beauty retail space uh, like Sephora have signed on to a pledge um, to reserve 15% um, of shelf, shelf space to black owned businesses and more uh, companies are following suit. Uh, clothing chains are even coming on board. Clothing chains and department stores are also reaching out to black owned beauty brands as they try to capitalize on the current public interest in equality. Uh, but it talks about some of the challenges that black owned businesses face um, because, of, uh, because of the scale asso or associated and that needs to go into um, scaling up your business to get into these retail stores. The article goes on to say, but for black owned business owners, the least likely to receive bank loans and VC funding, the cost to be in retail is a heavy burden and a deal to the supply chain um, or, or a national chain can either make their business or tank it. So getting into these big stores can either make their businesses soar or it can tank it because they don't have the necessary cash flow in operations to actually um, make, it, uh, make it work. And also the marketing costs that are associated with getting into these stores. So off top, retailers take 50 to, 50 to 60% a cut of their sales. Um, and then also, if you don't have enough inventory and, you know, to package, ship and deliver to these actual you know, stores, um, then these retailers don't actually want to work with you. So basically, this article really talks about all the costs that are associated with scaling up a business. And that is an area in which many Black owned businesses um, lack uh, the ability in terms of scaling, whether it be through operational uh, types of concerns or actual funding type of concerns as well. So this is a great article to, that talks about all of this in Bloomberg. And it's really a case study for any physical type of good that actually wants to scale their businesses moving forward. Uh, the next article, let's see here. Yeah, so the next article comes from the Harvard Business Review. So it states uh, how businesses can recruit and develop more young people of color. Um, and it starts off talking about a book called There is Life After College. Uh, writer and researcher Jeffrey Salingo found that only one third of today's graduates jump into their careers um, or start down a path that will lead to success in the working world right after graduation. Uh, he refers to these groups as sprinters. The other types of groups are wanderers and stragglers. Um, but for the sprinters, 80% uh, of these graduates you know, what separates the sprinters from everyone else is because they had opportunities that other people didn't have. So 80% had internship opportunities, 64% uh, were committed to a major without changing it, and 43% had less than $10,000 in student loan debt. Um, but, you know, in terms of getting into this actual group of, of um, sprinters, of course, Black and Latino students were lagging behind everyone else. So the article goes to lay out just different things that uh, organizations can do to get more African-Americans and Latinos into the sprinter category. So one part was start professional development early. Uh, the next was increase access to te technology, uh, improving the hiring practices of an organization. Um, uh, so those were, I guess, the three major recommendations. So check out this article from Harvard Business Review. I think you'll really enjoy it as well. The last uh, article is a case study um, in, um, in, I guess, an expose into the life of Tajane Tiam, uh, who was the CEO of Credit Suisse. Um, he was hired to make Credit Suisse profitable again because they were going through a down patch, but was uh, discarded after he actually finished the job. Um, and the main reason why he thinks and other people think that he was is just because of cultural differences and being a black face in a white space because you can't get any whiter than you know, Zurich, Switzerland, when it comes to um, wealth and banking and like those types of things as well. Uh, but the article starts, you know, talking about how he came from a wealthy family, 
um, a prominent family in uh, the Ivory Coast. Uh, but of course, you know, they were going through civil war at that time and, you know, attempted coup coups and that type of thing. Um, and his father was actually jailed for three years uh, with the charges, you know, eventually dropped. But it kind of showed some of the um, things that he had to go through as a child um, living in that type of space. But of course, you know, he was you know, highly educated um, and was able to overcome just, you know, where he came from to climb to being, you know, the top job at uh, one of the largest banks in the world, uh, which is, you know, Credit Suisse. But it didn't really work out. Uh, it talked about his cultural differences and also uh, him being underneath a lot of just different scrutiny uh, when it came to being a black face in a, in, in a white space. But it's a very intriguing article that I think that you should you know, take the time and really read, especially those individuals who actually want to climb the corporate ladder. Um, I think you would get a lot out of this particular article today. But as for the second time around, uh, I think this went uh, <laughs> better than the first time. I think you guys could actually hear me in the five articles for today. Uh, but let me know what you thought about the five articles uh, today. Also, let me know what you think about the financial Juneteenth second. This is something that you want us to uh, continue to complete and do uh, later on because we're going to give it a six week trial. If you all like it, we'll continue it. If not, uh, we'll go in a, a different direction in terms of the Black Financial Channel. So on behalf of the Black Financial Channel, my name is Lawrence Watkins. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Take care, be blessed, and have a wonderful day.